COVID on our lowest income uh, uh, earners and also uh, the fact that when you want to stimulate the economy at any given point, making sure you're giving more income to those who have the least uh, almost guarantees it's going to go back into the economy. Do you have an update uh, on the bill for MP pay cuts? Is that coming next week? And is that part of, of a same bill allowing councillors to give part of their salary back to council? So it's all covered by the um, remuneration uh, legislation, which is overseen by the remuneration authority. And so, yes, the way that MPs um, uh, pay and others such as local government sits within uh, that legislation. So we're drafting that as we speak. You know that we've already made um, decisions about ourselves. Um, it is certainly not for us to make decisions about anyone else, though. Uh, I expect that to be ready, you know, shortly. Um, but regardless of the timelines for that, we've still committed to six months, regardless of when it comes into Parliament. Uh, yeah, uh, a question, Ben. A question on the regions, um, Prime Minister. Are there are four where there's not a current case of COVID-19. In Wanganui, there hasn't been any case for 11 days. In Tairawhiti, it's 16 days. The West Coast... 25 days and it's a full four weeks since there was a case in the Wairapa. And given these places are some of the most disadvantaged in New Zealand, do you think there is a case for opening up movement and the economy sooner than other places? Yeah, one of the things that um, uh, you will have heard me talk about is we did give serious consideration to regional approaches and there may be a time when we use them in the future. But when you think about the difference between alert level three and four for those areas, um, it is, for instance, engaging in online commerce. Uh, quite hard to draw regional distinctions on something like that. Uh, and, of course, in the other areas are just whether or not you're, you're trading face-to-face. Um, -face. For that, we still have to be mindful that New Zealanders move. And there are, for instance, the Whited Up is an example, where we do have people who commute for work. And so some of those distinctions are a bit arbitrary when you're really trying to make sure that we've got control of the virus and we aren't transporting where we may have cases into other areas. So not for now, but we haven't ruled it out in the future. Yeah. Something though, like let's send them to alert level two ahead of other places and restrict movement between other regions. Is that I haven't, and again, I haven't ruled it out for any part of our COVID response, but we just haven't utilised it at this phase. Yep. Follow up to that, and Mikey's question before about level two. Couldn't you make the case that where we are at level two now in terms of the risk assessment, it speaks of the fact that household transmission could be occurring single or isolated cluster outbreaks, whereas level three says there is a risk that community transmission might be happening. You seem to have said that that's not the case. Mm. You have confidence in that. So aren't we at level two in terms of that and risk level? And that's where that distinction about this waiting room is so important. So of course, uh, what we've also had to factor in as we've gone along is a very clear message that we've had in terms of the impacts of moving too quickly. Are the risks of second waves are the risks that you may have had asymptomatic transfer or that simply uh, there may be may have been a longer tail that's bubbling away. And so level three allows us that time to check that we have control before moving with greater confidence. The last thing anyone wants is us to move prematurely, have a resurgence and go back. That will be very bad for our health response, but equally horrific for our economy. Given, uh, does the government have a strategy regarding a COVID-19 vaccine? And given our success in stamping out the virus, is there a concern that we could be put at the back of the queue uh, if there is a vaccine developed overseas? I'll let I'm, I'm Dr. Whitfield really start. Uh, what I can say is there's uh, very active work underway between ourselves and um, MB to um, uh, finalise an approach that we're going to take uh, as a country, uh, including you know, everything from uh, research uh, which might include participating in uh, clinical trials, uh, as well as uh, ensuring we're in the queue for um, whichever vaccine might be the one that's successful. Recalling there are, I think, upwards of 90 or 100 trials underway around the world um, at the moment. So we're um, getting a planned approach to this and very keen on taking an ANZAC approach to that as well. So working closely with Australia and we'll have um, some more about that within the next week. Can we talk about the oh, yeah. Yeah. Is, is there any work specifically in New Zealand to develop the vaccine, so there has been talk about that in There has been talk and there is interest from different research groups. At, at, at this point, um, we, we're not anticipating New Zealand's um, uh, best uh, uh, endeavours are to put um, funding and effort into trying to develop a vaccine, but rather to work alongside 
other uh, vaccine developers. Is, it's, it's very expensive, um, and that doesn't mean that our research groups here couldn't do elements of the research that would contribute to um, international efforts. And also, more importantly, I think, be um, participating in potential clinical trials. Uh, but as I say, that will be all covered in our, our vaccine um, sort of approach, which is currently being worked on. Keeping in mind there's also the difference between development and manufacture, and so that's, that's something that I think we shouldn't, uh, even if we're not uh, necessarily directly involved in one part, certainly can be in the other. Minister, uh, we've been told that the Ministry of Social Development doesn't have, or at the very least can't provide, sort of detailed breakdown or demographic data of those applying for the job seeker benefit. Would you need that to sort of inform, um, you know, detailed solutions or targeted solutions of support? We have been trying to pick up the pace of the um, data that we are providing uh, around what's happening with our uh, um, benefits at a more rapid pace. So we are trying to tune that out more frequently. Um, I would really need to ask the question around MSD as to whether or not that's data that's collected or just simply cannot be aggregated in short periods of, of time. Um, but what we do know, um, because this is analysis that we can draw from even the work that the Treasury has done as part of its living standards framework, we do know those regions, those um, demographics, those New Zealanders who are already profoundly affected by low incomes, who are more likely to uh, work in precarious areas of work, so where they are more vulnerable to loss of hours or job loss. So that is, that is information that we already have as a country, uh, and it's why we have, for instance, targeted uh, so many of our initiatives, be it the Provincial Growth Fund uh, or MSD support packages like mana and mahi. Um, so whilst we might not have that specific data in COVID, there are things we already know about our community which helps us target our response. So you're um, working to aggregate that data? Again, I, I don't want to give you a specific answer without asking MSD directly uh, around what the issues may be around quick turnover of some of that data. But they have been working hard to try and provide more information outside of the usual cycle of what they provide. Prime Minister, yeah. Prime Minister uh, Green Party co-leader Marama Davidson believes that essential workers should be getting at least a living wage. Do you agree? Oh. I want all New Zealanders to be able to not only survive on what they earn, um, but have a really good quality of life. And that should be the aspiration that everyone in New Zealand has for our fellow New Zealanders. What I think we've seen at the moment is uh, a growing awareness of the critical role that people in jobs that have often been undervalued play. But even, even in a short-term capacity, given that the added health risk for essential workers and given that the government is already investing billions of dollars uh, into subsidies and packages. Is this something that the government could look at on a short-term basis, bringing those essential workers' wages who are below a living wage up to a living wage? What we have been doing is, for instance, for, for example, our nursing workforce um, is working hard to see their wages lifted, and that's something that we've been doing since we've been in government. Equally, I would say the same, for instance, for people who uh, are cleaners in our schools. Again, uh, that uh, work we've already done to see their wages lifted. Where the government has a role to play, we've played it. What I would ask the private sector is to value your workforce in the same way. We've seen the importance of people who are working on our front line, whether they are cleaners, whether they collect waste, um, or whether they're working at a supermarket. Can I just ask a follow-on question to Charlie's one about vaccines? Mm. Um, there's been some promising signs in the US about that antiviral drug, um, when mm. Desivere, which has been used mm. for Ebola. Has the ministry here been given any advice about it? Is New Zealand interested in that drug? Yes, well, I heard Dr Fauci this morning uh, uh, waxing quite enthusiastically about it, so I did a little bit of research. Um, uh, I'm yet to see the study that he was referring to, two earlier studies, one of which is published in The Lancet, actually done in, um, in Wuhan, uh, didn't show any uh, impact of the drug and neither did the other one. So I'm very interested to see this. I should point out Remdesivir is still a, an investigatory um, drug. It's not one that's licensed for treatment for any condition in any country at the moment. So it's very early in these trials, which also had you know, relatively small numbers of participants, several hundred in each arm. So watching very closely, and, and this is an area of expertise of Dr Fauci, so I was particularly uh, interested in his um, interpretation of the data. We'll watch to see what happens when that is published. Thomas. So, Prime Minister, Prime Minister, just um, on, on um, drugs, uh, an analysis from a cybercrime unit in Australia has found that there are 645 listings for um, coronavirus-related medical products, 
uh, including vaccines and respirators, which have been found on the dark web. Have we seen any similar reports of, of alleged coronavirus vaccines on our dark web? And if so, are we doing anything about it? I have to say, um, in the monitoring that I receive, I'm not getting any of that data on an ongoing basis. Uh, again, I can I can ask um, the question, but that's not something that's been proactively raised with me. Can I ask a question on behalf of our, um, the project Fano? That burger fuel photo has sparked a debate about dobbing in violators, big gatherings or small gatherings. How important is it that Kiwis uh, report breaches of any size? Do you know, I think one of the things that's driving that from Kiwis is that sense that actually we do all have a role to play. Uh, you know, we're members of a, a big team and our success is dependent on one another. Uh, and so I'm not sure that I would characterise it as, as dobbing uh, necessarily, because actually that's not really in our culture as a country, but really a reflection of people really wanting us not to let one another down. Uh, and so I do think it's probably just a, a matter of people saying, actually, we're doing our bit, we want you to as well. Uh, let's make sure that we're doing everything we can not to let the side down. When it, when it comes to regional travel under level two uh, in New Zealand, put up a, a sort of wish list of maps that like, uh, of routes they'd like to take. What is the advice that you've developed around level two? So we'll have seen that we've already put out some of the advice at the different alert levels. Um, Cabinet will of course be discuss discussing in a bit more finer detail, and I expect um, travel to be part of that. What, uh, again, just checking that we've got those settings right. Uh, as I said, we have actually worked through most of that already when we moved, uh, when we did the finer detail around alert level three. But as is our practice, we keep doing double checks as we move through the alerts that we think it's matching our needs at that time. The essential workforce that will be allowed to travel, non-essential, still banned? And we have, again, at Alert Level 2, big focus for us there um, uh, is still issues like mass gatherings uh, and tr uh, ongoing preventative measures on containment. And when you think about some of the outbreaks we've had, it's often been that regional movement that's been really problematic for us. But we keep assessing as we go to make sure we've got those settings right. And Sorry, just one more. And therefore, looking at the, at the idea of the trans-Tasman bubble, at what alert level would we need to be before we even entertain the idea of letting Aussies come in? Yeah, regardless, I think there, there's actually there's a quite a bit of work that needs to be done uh, in that space. But I think you will have heard both Prime Minister Morrison and myself uh, you know, speak really positively about the potential there. You know, we are both as countries working really hard to get control of COVID-19. And our goal is to make life feel as normal as possible. And eventually, uh, I would hope that would mean our ability um, to have movement between our countries. But that is a longer term goal. Uh, yeah, I'll come to the front and then Mikey. Um, a, a couple of days ago, or maybe about long ago, you told us that you're going to be meeting with Dr. Varel again to talk mm. about her um, contact tracing report. Can you tell us how that went and, and her response to, to what you plan to do with her report? Well, hot off the press, uh, she was waiting in the Ministry of Health um, uh, vestibule when I came to walk down here for this uh, media conference. So she's in there this afternoon meeting with the team. Uh, so I'll catch up with her later in the afternoon and see what her, her um, thoughts are. In the vestibule. Follow up on mass gatherings, please, Prime Minister. Do you expect mm. whether or not we go into level two or one? Do you expect uh, restrictions on mass gatherings to continue yes. at least till the end of the year? We haven't put a strict timeline around that, um, but in the short term, yes. Um, do continue to expect that there will be limitations around uh, mass gatherings. In preparation for movement, though, of course, we've been working with the Hospitality Association, others who are involved in uh, areas of work that involve gatherings of people just to try and prepare ourselves for some of those different alert levels, but do expect that to be part of our reality in the, in the near term. Yeah. Dr Bloomfield, are you ruling out developing a COVID-19 vaccine in New Zealand? Oh no, it's not for me to rule out, um, but we've got a good team of people. Actually, the ministry effort led by our chief science advisor, Dr Ian Town, who's actually a respiratory doctor by by training uh, and working with MB and also with input from researchers around the country coming up with an approach. We'd like to take that to ministers first to get agreement uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll, that will have advice around where we think our efforts are best um, focused at each, at each point in the vaccine um, development and, uh, and access mm -hmm. uh, cycle. Sorry, um, Sir Peter Gluckman says Māori and iwi should be more involved in pandemic response decisions because of their holistic thinking. What measures is the government taking to, to better improve Māori? I actually um, had a um, conversation with um, Professor Tahu um, Kukutai this morning and um, Professor Tracy McIntosh. They're both members of our science advisory network uh, and you know we were reflecting together actually the 
uh, and a really important part of our response that has been driven by, um, by iwi, by whānau order providers, um, by um, Māori wardens who have been involved and at a local community level particularly. I do think that the innovation we've seen from um, Māori in response to COVID is something that we need to learn from and scale up, but also the te ao Māori approach of community wellbeing um, absolutely needs to be one of our ongoing lessons in our pandemic response. Prime Minister. Um, please. Have you sent a, a message of congratulations to Prime Minister Johnson? Yes, I have. I'm um, just congratulating him on behalf of New Zealand for the for the birth of his baby boy, and I cannot imagine the roller coaster of experiences him and his family have been having now. But this, I'm sure, will be bring joy um, to his family. Have so, you given thought to schools in terms of the fact that last time you gave them a week to open from four to three, will you do the same between a level three and level two? While we haven't put um, specific timelines, I have indicated that we do like to give a level of notice before uh, uh, we change alert levels, just to make sure that it's, um, uh, that it's considered, that it's planned, and that we can do it with confidence. Anything abrupt with such uh, big changes, I don't think is actually good for New Zealand, let alone our education system. So just, I appreciate a lot of these issues have been talked about in different parts of today's conference, but I'm just trying to put a bow on it. It sounds like uh, Level 2 previously and the Level 2 we're going to enter into are going to look different in a number of respects. Is that, is that fair to say? Oh, no, I think the primary, I think probably people's primary reflection from Level 2 for the first period that we were in it was the issue of ongoing social distancing and that stays. Um, and issues around mass gatherings, the number of people on indoor venues and outdoor venues, and there's no change there either. Um, and of course, the expectations around the amount of domestic travel that was happening. So, no, I think people will be already you know, familiar, albeit for a short time, of what Level 2 meant. So gatherings up to 100 people inside. Yep, so you'll see that, that all of that um, guidance remains the same at Level 2. We do still need to be careful and cautious around issues of mass gatherings. You'll see that for many countries that are changing and moving through uh, their restrictions, mass gatherings is still a common theme that is remaining for many countries. Social. Um, so the, last couple of questions. In terms Thomas. of the distancing, when people are sort of in a restaurant or a cafe um, and they're not allowed to be within two metres of each other, yeah. when does that go? Is that level one or, or level zero? I'll have to refresh and have a little look at that final guidance on, on level one, but certainly at level two, again, what we're trying to do is just making sure that if we see any resurgence that we uh, make our contact tracing easier. And if you've been in a public space like a cafe, uh, having two metres of distance means it's less likely that someone else nearby who contracts COVID will have you winding up in isolation for two weeks. Last Mr. question. Uh, from a colleague, just to clarify, will regional travel potentially still be off the cards for non-essential workers at level two? Yeah, and that's, again, we're already, that is part of the guidance that we have given. Um, but uh, we as a cabinet, as we have done in the past, have uh, reconfirmed what will be happening at the different alert levels before we've moved into them. We will again give consideration specifically to the settings of alert level two before we make any announcements. So I'm happy to talk to you about them at that time. How is that with that quick fire PPE review that you ordered? Uh, so, sorry, that was the audit of PPE and the way it was being distributed by DHBs. Mm -hmm. Dr Bluegill. Yes, so uh, got a report uh, late on Friday, uh, had a look at it over the weekend actually in, in, a great, in great detail and we're just finalising a report on that to the Minister uh, and that will include the detail that will go up to him later today and then um, it's in his hands because he was the one who directed that uh, so he will decide um, how and when he, he will use that. For my part, looking at it, I was very reassured by what I saw. Um, last one? Uh, because it was, it was the Minister who requested that so I think it's only appropriate that he sees the information and makes a decision about the release of it. Mm -hmm. time before to him though, right? He doesn't have it yet. Mm. Yeah, is that what well, I don't, I don't think it's unreasonable for the Ministry of Health and the, the Director General of Health to take two days to look at a report and then give it to the Minister. All right. Um, uh, what is your advice to New Zealand residents in the US, given the situation there? Should they come home? Sorry, our advice for... To, to New Zealand residents in the US, should they come home? Oh, look, we, we gave advice um, very early on in the pandemic. Uh, around New Zealanders using the windows that were available for travel. Many New Zealanders who are overseas are resident overseas. They live there, they have jobs there, they have family there. And so our message um, uh, uh, some time ago was uh, what they call in foreign affairs term shelter in place, um, stay where you are. Um, and we haven't altered our advice since that time. Okay, thanks everyone.